Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Dr. James Beely from the University of Glasgow, who'll be talking about designing custom chips and sensors and lab and appeal technology. Thanks very much. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to talk today about the process of designing and fabricating chips. And I'm also going to talk a little about some of the um, research prototype chip projects I've been involved with designing. So I'm basically going to, I'm going to look at the process of designing application specific integration circuits, ASICs. Uh, I'm going to look a little bit at uh, chip founders and processes. Um, I'm going to look at the process of designing and ver verifying analog chip hardware um, and digital hardware. I'm going to look a little at reverse engineering and fake chips. Then I'm going to look at a couple of projects I've been involved with, um, which are capsules for, for um, doing autofluorescence and uh, ultrasound examination inside the human intestine. So the first question is, if you, if you looked at a chip, what would you find? Okay. If you look around the edge of the chip, um, you will see a pad ring, and you've got little bond pads, and th these allow you to, to bring out bond wires to a chip package or to a circuit board. Um, they let you bring in power and bring out signals. Um, this is an RF chip. The other thing that are quite prominent on the chip are inductors in the middle of the, um, and to the right. These are, these are fabricated on the metal layers of the chip. Um, there's also a digital block on the left. Um, this, has been fabric this has been synthesized by a digital synthesis tool to fit into um, the space on the left of the chip. Um, chips are built on a number of different uh, fabrication technologies. Okay. The most common, the most dominant is silicon. Um, The really dominant technology um, is CMOS, um, complementary metal, metal ox oxide. Um, this is really the most widely used technology, used in the great bulk of digital um, chips. Um, bipolar analog is also not uncommon. Um, there are also more specialized silicon um, technologies like bi-CMOS, which combines bipolar and CMOS in the same chip. It's generally used for op amps and RF work. Um, there's also BCD, which is used for power electronics, but CMOS is really the, this has really become the dominant um, technology. Um, the simple reason being that uh, the, the two main transistor types, the bipolar transistor, um, this will, if you're using the, uh, your device as, as a digital switch, a bipolar transistor will draw current um, when it is switching, and it will also uh, um, draw current in the steady state. A CMOS transistor will only draw current when switching. When it's switched on or off, it will draw almost no current. And this is really why CMOS has become the dominant uh, technology for digital design, simply because the power consumption is much lower. Okay? And because so, many of, so mu much of the hardware designed is done in CMOS, um, there's been a great emphasis on putting other functionality into CMOS chips. So there's been a lot of interest in, in putting um, analog functionality onto CMOS chips um, to produce mixed signal chips. Um, there are also more specialized technologies. Um, for example, silicon carbide power transistors, silicon germanium for um, radio frequency work. And for LEDs, light emitting diodes, there are a number of different technologies, um, gallium phosphides, um, zinc selenide, etc. Okay, but the really key, th the key thing with this is Although CMOS is dominant, there is no one technology that will do everything, okay? So although the, the semiconductor industry is heavily geared towards CMOS, um, there is no single technology that will do everything that you want to do. If you, really, the main, the main building block of a CMOS chip is a MOSFET transistor, okay? The picture, it basically shows what, what you get if you took a vertical slice through a CMOS transistor. Um, and it's basically fabricated um, on a silicon wafer. And you're basically fabricating, when you're fabricating, you're basically using a, a series of masks um, and a series of etching processes. Um, and you're, you're basically implanting um, impurities into the silicon to create PN junctions. And in the case of the, the CMOS transistor, you're also fabricating a um, polysilicon gate on top. And when you apply a voltage between the gate and the source, this will cause a current to flow between source and drain. And it effectively means your CMOS transistor is a voltage-controlled current device. Um, 
And the main defining feature of a CMOS and a CMOS process is what's called feature size. Um, feature size is basically the smallest gate width that you can fabricate um, in a given process. And this, this will vary according to process. It might be 0.5 micron in a, a power process, right down to 7 nanometer in a state-of-the-art, let's say, Intel processor. Um, there was a nice talk at Case Communication Congress by Are, who went into this in a lot more detail, so I'd strongly make it recommend you look at that. Um, on your chip, you, you've got transistors, you'll have resistors, capacitors, inductors. Now, to interconnect, you'll have metal layers, okay? And coming up from each of these devices, you'll have vertical metal vias. Then you will have typically between 2 and 12 metal layers. Um, now, your chips will be fabricated on a silicon wafer, which is typically 30 centimeters diameter. Um, and after fabrication, the chips will be separated um, using a dicing saw. Now, when you're pro now the, the setup cost of a process is very high, it would be the order of 100,000 pounds. So if you're prototyping, and the work I've done is basically, basically been developing um, early stage proof of concept prototype chips, you use a multi-project wafer service. And in this case, if anyone's used PCB pool or similar, um, basically the, the, the MPW service, they'll basically do a wafer and it will have a number of different chips in a single wafer. And this will bring the cost down from 100,000 pounds, maybe 10, 15,000 pounds, in other words, to what a university research budget can afford. Okay, you've got, uh, there's a whole range of devices you can have on chips. You can have resistors, which will be fabricated in polysilicon. Um, you've got, you can fabricate capacitors um, using two, the capacitance between two adjacent metal layers. You can have inductors, which are tiny coils made of metal. Um, you always got bond pads to bring signals out. Um, there, you can also do sensors, um, for example, charge couple device or CMOS sensors um, for light sensing, photodiodes, um, S pads, single photon avalanche diodes for sensing very low light levels, um, IS for sensing pH. And there's a lot of interest in putting sensors on CMOS because it means that you can put the sensor and the processing electronics on the same chip. A lot of the old digital cameras. Um, use um, CCD, charge couple device. Charge couple device needs a separate um, chip to address and process signals. The CMOS sensor allows you to put the imager and electronics on the same die with a resultant saving in cost and size. You can also process op things, for example, optical fields on top of the chip. So I'm going to talk a bit about the design process. This is what I do for a job. Um, there are th really th only three major dominant manufacturers. Um, there's basically um, Synopsys, Cadence, and Mentor Graphics. Now, the problem is because it's quite a specialized um, process, there aren't a lot of companies. Um, the software is very capable. It's expensive. Um, it can leave a bit to be desired in terms of usability. Um, open source support is very limited. There is magic, but this is, this is quite an old and limited um, open source package, but basically pretty much everyone will use a commercial package for one of the three major manufacturers, okay? One side obviously is the design software, the other side is a design kit. Um, this is supplied uh, by your chip manufacturer, your chip foundry, and it's specific to the chip design process, okay? So this, they will basically give you, they'll give you a set of simulation models, they'll give you digital standard cells for digital synthesis, uh, they'll give you design rules because each process has a set of rules in terms of um, things like gate width, track width, spacing between structures. And these are manufacturer, ma manufacturability rules that have to be adhered to pretty strictly. If you don't meet these rules, they won't even try and fabricate your chip. Okay? The other, interest, the other thing is that a lot of the devices are parameterizable. So that you could, for example, have a transistor and you could define a width-length ratio to define its gain, or you could have a resistor where you define its resistance. Um, the, other, the, other thing, uh, the other thing that you can often pick up from other manufacturers are IP blocks, intellectual property blocks. Because of the expense and complexity and risk in designing um, chip hardware, um, there's a strong emphasis on design reuse. In other words, if you've got hardware that works, or a sub-block that works, you would tend to reuse that. And it means that there are many companies who are, they're actually selling validated and verified third-party IP blocks. 
Again, these could be parameterizable. So you might, for example, buy in a ROM or a RAM block for a processor. And when you buy it, you would specify um, uh, specify the RAM depth, ROM depth, and then and data bus width. There are three, two kinds. There, there are, you, you've got hard cores. Hard cores are specific to a particular chip process. You also have soft cores. They will come in a hardware description language. And you can put them through your synthesis tool, and you can synthesize them into your own process. Um, so there are all sorts of blocks, for example, ADCs, digital analog converters, op amps, buffers, um, phase lock loops. There are various uh, bus cores, for example, PCI Express, CAN bus for automotive, USB, which again, which will be pre-verified. And you can even buy an entire process. This is really how, this is ARM's business model. ARM don't actually make processors. ARM sell processor cores to third parties who integrate those into their own chips along with all the functionality. So if you want to design a chip, your starting point will be a specification. You define what you want your chip to do, your uh, power budget, pinout, etc. And that will take you on to a particular fabrication process. Then you'll partition your design down, you'll partition it down into manageable units, into analog blocks and digital blocks. Um, then you carry out your design and you'll spend a lot of time simulating and verifying because the problem with the chip is with a, with a circuit, you can, you, know, you can pull out your craft knife and soldering iron and rework it. Um, if you write a piece of code and it's buggy recompile, you cannot do that with a chip. So with chip design, you spend a lot of time in verification. You spend a lot of time on simulation, analog simulation, digital simulation, mixed signal simulation, and design rule checking, and layout versus schematic checking. So before you submit a design, you want to be very confident that that design is valid and it's going to work. And in the real world, you often go through multiple iterations. It will often take you quite a few iterations to get something that actually meets spec. So, I don't know how, how many people have done PCB design. The analog entry process is very similar. You have a schematic tool, and you have a library of transistors, resistors, capacitors, etc., which are supplied. They're part of your design kit. And you'll basically enter those in your schematic tool, Cadence Virtuoso, for example. And you'll parameterize them. You will set the value of a resistor. You'll set the width-length ratio of, of a transistor, etc. Then you simulate um, each of the design tools that will it will incorporate an analog spice. It's like basically a, a P-spice type simulator. Um, Cadence case, for example, AD or Spectre, Synopsis do H-spice, and you will define inputs. You, you can do it basically a, a transient suite, for example, where you define inputs at times. And then you'll get a waveform output. And you'll basically need to look at that and see if that meets spec. You can also do things like frequency sweeps. You can also sweep um, over a range of temperature. Because obviously device, device behavior will vary with temperature, um, with um, process tolerance, um, and with supply voltage. And you can also look at things like phase and gain margin for stability amplifiers. And again, you'll go through iterations. Once you have something that meets spec, uh, then you move into the layout phase. So you've basically got an analog layout tool. Um, so basically, in your schematic tool, you'll basically pick each device. Um, the layout tool, it will generate an appropriately shaped transistor, resistor, inductor, etc. You then have to manually place them. And you also have to, when you place them, you have to consider carefully signal integrity. For example, keeping noisy digital circuitry away from sensitive analog circuitry, you will then have to manually run uh, wires on the metal layers, wires and wires between those devices. Then you can do um, a layout versus schematic check. Okay, that will check that your layout matches the schematic. You also do a design rule check. That checks that this layout matches or complies with the um, designer's um, design rules. Okay. The other issue you have is parasitics. You, you've, you've so far, you've simulated transistors with ideal connections between them. Okay, you have now, now you've done a layout, you have now added extra metal wires in the metal layer. These will bring in stray inductance and capacitance and resistance. And these will tend to have an effect, particularly on RF circuits. So then you run parasitic extraction. This will add to your simulation model. It will add additional capacitance and inductances. So you then re-simulate with parasitics um, and once you've done that, again, iterate a few times, you have a valid analog block. 
the digital design process for anything but the simplest designs is built, it's built around hardware description languages. So you're basically, you're basically writing, writing a programming language description of the functionality you want from your chip. So common languages are VHDL, Verilog, System C, System Verilog. Um, and you're, like, you're basically coding up a description of functionality of things like counters, buses, addressing, state machines, etc. Now these languages, unlike conventional coding, they're inherently parallel because you're coding up a number of functions in hardware which will operate simultaneously. The other thing you need to be careful about is each of your synthesis tools only implements a subset of Verilog or VHDL. So you could, I mean, you, you could code something in C or Python. You could write it five different ways, it'll work. Verilog or VHDL, you could code something in syntactically valid VHDL or Verilog, but only a subset will work. So each tool has its own subset. So again, you've got to read the documentation. You really need to follow, let's say, Cadence or Synopsis recommend way of coding, okay? These languages are also, they're also modular to allow design reuse to allow you to reuse IP blocks. Um, an important feature is a test bench. A test bench is basically a top level. You basically instantiate your design as a module. The test bench provides basically a set of inputs for testing, okay, which you'd use in simulation. So, you'd, so when, once you've got syntactically valid VHDL, you'd put that and your compiler and your test bench into a simulation tool like VCS or NCSIM. This will give you a waveform output, okay? So you, you would basically define all your input signals, define your clocks, define your reset, define your data buses. This will give you a waveform output, okay? This allows you to verify that your code is functionally correct. At this stage, it doesn't include any timing delays. And again, iterate this multiple times until it works, okay? Your next step is synthesis. Once you have a valid VHDL description of your circuit, the synthesis tool, this will convert that into a netlist of gates because the, gate, the gates are process specific. The gates will be provided, or gates or blocks, they'll be provided by your um, ASIC foundry. So you'll basically, you'll give your synthesis tool a Verilog or VHDL netlist input. Um, you'll give it the timing information for the gates and you'll also give it constraints. You might, you, you can constrain power. Um, you can, you might say this pin's a clock and it works at 50 megahertz. You might say this pin has to have proper, uh, this output has to have a clock to output delay of not more than five microseconds. You give it those constraints, the synthesis tool will then attempt to meet those. Uh, and again, you may need to iterate this a few times. And assuming synthesis is successful, it will generate a netlist, but you, you now have a netlist of gates provided by the ASIC manufacturer, okay? You've also got a standard delay file, SDF. Um, this provides, basically provides system time delays, in other words, the propagation delays within each block or gate, okay? Now, this pro now because it requires iteration, the process is heavily command line driven, okay? You can see a graphical interface there, but a lot of the commands are, are uh, a lot of the functionality is command line based and this is so you can script it because again you often go through many iterations so the whole thing is scriptable using tcl tool command language so you'll basically take your commands from your first iteration put those into a text file and that will give you a script that allows you to rapidly reiterate when you never have to go back and make design changes from your synth from your netlist you've got a, so you've now got a netlist verilog or vhdl netlist of gates and timing you'll put this into a place and root tool for example cadence encounter the place and root tool it will take that netlist and it will physically lay it out within actual silicon okay so your starting point you'll define the boundaries of your digital block so if you think if you think, think back to the, the um Second slide I put up of the uh, of the chip. There was a digital block which had irregularly defined boundaries. You you can actually you can shape your digital block to fit around other devices. So basically, you, you determine the boundary of the digital block. You set up power and ground rings around it, um, and that, and you'll import your netlist. And again, you'll give it timing constraints. You'll define which signals are clocks, which are resets, which are asynchronous. asynchronous. Um, then the, the place and root tool, it will auto place those cells in rows. It's basically row based. If you, look if you were to look at a, a digital chip very closely, you'd see row, row, row of chips. It will auto place. Um, it will then generate a clock tree, okay? The clock 
is the, the clock is basically the, the source of synchronization for all the synchronous elements in the, in the circuit. And the goal of clock tree generation is to, is to minimize the skew or the time difference between different clock signals within the, within the chip. So the, it, will basically, it will basically place the clock net and clock buffer. It will basically prioritize that first. Um, then you're on the auto router. The auto router will attempt to um, auto place tracks, which will interconnect the cells. Um, then, it will, then you run a static timing analysis. This will basically check each path through the system and it will check it meets the constraints. And if it doesn't meet the constraints, the, the, it, the tool can, it can, to a certain extent, fix timing violations. It can um, insert buffers into clock paths or signal paths. Um, but again, if you have major timing issues, you may just have to go back and reiterate the design. Okay. Assuming you get through place and route successfully, Again, you run verification, um, you'd run design rule checking. Um, then it will generate um, an output block in Cadence, for example, in Oasis format, which you can import back into Virtuoso. Um, then it will give you an output netlist, which you can use for simulation and an output timing, uh, timing signals. It, which mean, and this means that you can then, you can then do a post place and route simulation. Okay, it means that you can re-simulate with gate delays and interconnect delays. And again, you want to check that meets your specification. And if not, again, reiterate. Your next step, once you have valid analog and digital blocks, is chip assembly. Okay, you'll basically lay, you'll basically lay out the complete chip. You'll, um, and you'll, you'll basically you'll have uh, bond pads, analog input and output pads. You'll basically place a, a pad ring around the edge of your chip. Um, you will place your analog and digital blocks in the chip, again, taking care to keep, over signal integrity, taking care to keep digital signals, which are noisy, away from analog signals. Again, you will manually um, put, put wire tracks to connect those blocks together. Um, again, you'll do a lot, of, a, lot of a lot of time spent doing design rule checking, layout versus schematic, parasitic extraction, mixed signal, uh, simulation, etc. This stage is, you're simulating the whole chip. This stage is slow and you're often rushing to do this to meet a chip deadline. Okay? Once you have a valid chip, the process, if this was done years ago in tape, it's still referred to as tape out. So you'll submit a GDS2 file to your chip foundry to, um, to your manufacturer. Uh, you'll then wait, certainly in our case, wait several months, you'll get a small number of chips back and spend a little amount of time testing. Now, a chip on its own is not a lot of use, so a chip needs to be bonded in, onto a circuit board or into a package. Okay? The bulk of chips will be wire bonded into a package. It will be a dual inline or a pin grid array or ball grid array package. And you'll have little bond wires, which are typically gold or aluminium, and these are bonded by an ultrasonic bond head. Um, if you look at the picture on the top right, there's a chip which is bonded to a package with little bond wires. They're basically bonded from the chip bond pads onto bond pads on the, on the, the package. And these pads on the package, these in turn are connected pins. Now, traditionally, um, the traditional package has been, has been a dual line package with uh, pins at 0.1 inch spacing. The limitation of that package is limited pin out. You have a limited number of pins. The other limitation is stray inductions and capacitance, which tend to impact badly on radio frequency circuits. So a lot of chips now will tend to use surface mount. They'll tend to use ball grid array. In this case, um, you have a chip bonded to a substrate, and then there'll be little solder balls on the underside of the substrate, which are basically ball, ball grid bonded to the circuit board. You can also have multiple substrates um, on the, or multiple chips on the same package. As I mentioned earlier, no one chip process is really suitable uh, for all, all functionality. So, on the bottom right is a WS2812, otherwise known as a NeoPixel. Um, this is a multi, this is a program with multicolor LED. It was on the EMF badge from two years ago. And if you look closely, you can see they've actually used, they've got four separate substrates. There are three chips at the bottom. These are three LEDs in different colors. And the top chip, this is a CMOS chip. So the CMOS will basically take a serial input command. It will then um, drive the three red, green, blue LEDs to give the program color. There's a whole, there's a whole industry devoted to reverse engineering of chips. Um, 
whether that's hobbyists, whether it's people looking to patent violations, people trying to figure out what the competition are doing. Now, most chips are packaged in resin. Now, to get the resin off requires nitric acid, which I wouldn't recommend for safety reasons. And beyond that, um, once you've taken off, once you've actually exposed the chip, you can then strip away the individual layers um, step by step. Again, again, if you want to look into this, a couple of nice websites, Rito.com, Zeptobars, they've got some very nice chip pictures. If you want to look at a chip yourself, there are metal case chips. There are devices. This, for example, is a power transistor. You can get them off eBay. The case will easily come off with a hacksaw or Dremel. So that will give you a fairly safe way to, if you feel like decapping a chip yourself. This is actually quite an interesting issue of um, fake chips. Um, this was something that turned up on the Zeptobar site. Um, they'd actually, they were looking at um, a Nordic NRF. This, this is basically a, an R, R, UHF RF transceiver. Um, the original chip comes in at about $10, okay? Um, and they've come across a fake. Somebody's obviously, somewhere looks like they've got a bootleg copy of Cadence. They're actually, they've actually managed to reverse engineer the complete chip. Again, more stuff on Zepto bars, and Bunny Huang has quite an Bunny Huang science has thoughts on this, okay? So we're talking now about some projects I've worked with. Um, this is the fluorescence imager capsule. Now, this is a project which I, I was, I've worked on at Glasgow University. Now, um, you, may, you may have come across white light imager capsules. It's basically, it's basically a capsule you swallow, and it has a camera, LED, and it lets you image the entire intestine. It's basically used to image disease, and it will cover parts of the intestine that um, endoscopy won't cover, because endoscopy will only cover down to the stomach, or below the stomach, and the large intestine. Endoscopes won't cover most of the small intestine. Um, now, autofluorescence, if you illuminate intestinal tissue with blue light, it will fluoresce green. You get weak fluorescence. This fluorescence lets you see early signs of disease that you're not going to see with white light. So we developed a, a prototype capsule um, to do fluorescence imaging of the intestine. Now, there, there, is, there is a well-proven um, fluorescence endoscope, but it only goes down to the stomach and duodenum, okay? So basically, we did a, um, a little 32 by 32 single photon avalanche diode S-pad array um, and power management and pulse counting on a chip. Um, and we basically integrated it um, into a miniature capsule. Um, we've integrated it with an FPGA for control and an 868 megahertz wireless link. Um, and th it, this, and we, we and we, we've, ba we've basically, we've, we've so far we have validated this on uh, intestinal tissue of a pig. Um, this is actually done on a lab bench. I, actually, I had to go out to a slaughterhouse to pick up uh, pig intestinal tissue, which is kind of fun. Um, and this is the fluorescence imaging ASIC. We did this in a 0.35 micron high voltage process. High voltage in the ASIC world means anything above five volts. Um, the little chip's about 3.7 by 3.7 millimeters. Um, you've got a single photon avalanche diode array. This is an array of very sensitive image. It'll basically give a pulse each time it gets hit by a single photon from autofluorescence. We've got pulse counters. We've also got a charge pump that generates 37 volts from a three volt hearing aid battery. Um, and this draws about 1.8 milliamps on average, imaging at one frame per second. And it, this, the capsule runs for about 12 hours, which is ample to work through for the human intestine. Um, another project I'm involved with at the moment is a sonopil. The basic idea is to do ultrasound examination below the surface of the human intestine. Because um, you can look from outside the body with, with ultrasound, maybe two or five megahertz. It will let you see through the whole body. For example, the ultrasound used in, um, for um, imaging pregnancy, it doesn't let you see much detail. If you increase frequency, you get less depth, but you have much greater detail. So the goal is to put 30 megahertz ultrasound inside a capsule to see a few millimeters below the intestinal surface. So the basic, basic idea is we'd have eight ultrasound drivers, a 32 element receiver array, um, data acquisition, embedded processor, and an ADC on chip. Okay, so this was the chip we designed. Again, this is done in a, one, in a 0.18 micron high voltage process. Um, we've got an on-chip processor. Um, we've got a data acquisition block. We've got 32 um, low noise amplifier receivers um, for acquiring data from the receiver array. We've got ultrasound transmitter. Um, and we did this, this is, we did this in an um, AMS ultrasound system process, about 16,000 gates. Um, this is currently bench tested. We're currently testing with, trans with transducers, okay? It's showing good signs so far. Um, 
I've been given hints to finish quickly. So this is just one more project I've had some involved. This is the multi corridor And the idea in this case was to put multiple um, medical diagnostic devices, benchtop devices, um, on a single uh, chip, a single handheld disposal chip. They're basically looking at pH, um, luminometer, spectrophotometers, um, to look at to basically look at metabolite at um, metabolites which are indicate markers for disease. Okay, and this basically had a, a, a 16 by 16 or 30 by 32 array of pixels, which are basically S pad for low light imaging, pH, um, and photodiode. Okay, and this chip basically had enzymes bonded onto the top. Um, and it's actually been proven with two different processes. One was an enzyme um, which determines a color change um, in, re in relation to cholesterol level, and the second, which was a pH change in um, relation to blood glucose. So it's this is basically a research prototype um, to demonstrate a small handheld device that can be used for disease diagnosis. Right, I'm given more hints to finish, so. These are just a couple of sites you might look at, look at for further reading if you want to look at more DCAP chips. Okay, thanks guys, we might have time for questions. I'm afraid we're probably not going to have time for questions. Where might they find you if they want right. to come and ask you questions? Right, I'll be outside. Outside, probably towards the bar. Right, I'll be over there. Yeah. That way, yeah, right. that's a okay. good idea. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, please thank uh, James very much for this fantastic talk, thank you. Mm -hmm.